Anyone who believes in indefinite growth on a physically finite planet is either mad or an economist. We don't want to focus politics on a notion that involves the rejection of principles around which a large majority of our fellow citizens organize their lives. We are not as endlessly manipulable and as predictable as you would think. When I started my career in the arts, I never questioned this. But there came a creeping realization that there was a justification requirement, a measurement requirement, a value judgment needed for the arts, which created an overall sense in me of a value-driven and potentially, therefore, a value-less activity. Artistic creation exists because it exists. Any influence it has for good, and yes, it has great influence for good, is a byproduct and not the reason for its creation. The selfless and the selfish artist, driven by a creative desire. The creative act cannot come from a need to make the world a better place, but from a need to create. A better world is created because it has art in it. But this, it began to be clear, was not enough. The selfish artist, the scrounger artist, the sponge soaking up public money needed to be justified to prove our value to society. And this chimed with our own belief as artists that we were not appreciated and needed to get justification to prove our value. As artists, we knew our creative process could and did make the world a better place. And we could prove it because of the effect art had. The act of theater is what happens in the space between the performer and the audience. The emotional response, the change in perspective, the pleasure, the pain. Good art changes things, and it changes you. So it became art for art's sake, and measurable impact equals value. Why did this need to happen? Partly because there was increasing pressure on public spending, regardless of the makeup of government, partly because of the lottery, huge amounts of public money diverted to arts buildings, partly because of the nature of the world we now live in. If you can't measure it, it can't be claimed as true, because truth is stronger than belief. So we set about looking for things that we knew art did, which could be shared, not because that process itself would create more great art, in fact, the quality of art wasn't the point. It was the process of creation and what that did that was the point. We developed creative practice and skills and looked for links that could both improve society and also be measured. We promoted the impact that our process as artists had on society. We developed strategies and activities that focused on well-being, creativity as a method of learning, art in prison, art in hospital, care home, schools. We carved money out of budgets for education departments, and some of us even got brave enough to lobby governments on educational policy. It helped us to raise money. In fact, I would say it's the biggest key we had to unlock considerable amounts of money for the arts, and it still is. Define and measure improved social value through creative programs, and then, oh yes, surely, and inevitably, we will be asked, and we will be willing to increase it. But it's hard. It's very hard indeed to measure social impact. Did a sculpture course heal mental health illness? Did listening to music improve your longevity? People see it working. They believe it works because they actually want it to work. And folks are finding ways of measuring the practically immeasurable. The RSA has several projects doing that right now. So then just as things were getting complicated and hard to actually measure, came economic and environmental impact. And its existence creates the evidence, and therefore the belief that there is a connection between a healthy functioning society and a creative and stimulating environment. Artists and public needed and wanted, and indeed need and still want, better, more public, more open, more accessible buildings. Capital investment requires evidence of need of value, of community support and engagement, of enhanced value of investment. The National Lottery has been the single biggest value in, additional value out program ever created in the UK. And thanks to John Major, it was focused on the arts and education. 
in towns and cities all over the country, the massive impact of environmental and economic improvement is tangible and measurable, and the arts have been right at the center of driving this social change program. And so it became arts for art's sake, plus social impact over economic and environmental impact equals value. We suffer the seesaw of attention, the political rhetoric that perfumes the air leading up to any election. I don't believe there ever would be a manifesto that didn't have an arts policy. But an arts policy in a silo is not an articulation of value. There is absolutely no joined up thinking on a policy for the arts as an industry or as a function fundamental to the cultural identity and prosperous future of the UK. We're in the middle of yet another half-baked and half-delivered programme of change in education. The drop in desire to study many arts subjects, 14% in schools, has been caused directly as a result of the perception by parents and the current government that these are not subjects that will be of value to you in future life. In addition, we are in the middle of the most radical change in local government we faced since the Second World War. The current inequalities in local authority funding for the arts will increase. In some areas, funding will be radically reduced or possibly eliminated. The settlement for centralised arts and heritage funding in the recent spending review could have been worse, but not much worse. And social services face massive change and reductions. We, the people, are going to be running many functions previously delivered by government. Libraries, community centres, community arts projects, reading programmes, citizens advice are all under-resourced and overstretched. So the context in which we approach an analysis of the value of the arts is, the, is a lens through which we must now find a way to develop a new rhetoric. Many others in the UK are working to find ways to express the intangible, sometimes immeasurable, massive role that the arts play in the cultural identity of this country. The papers from the RSA series of seminars held jointly with the Arts Council will be published in November and explore new ways for the arts to create, understand and articulate its value. The key for me was the opening ceremony of the Olympic Games. I think Danny Boyle has set in train something truly catalytic. That event proved that the arts define the culture of our nation and that event celebrated the culture of our nation through art. Arts for art's sake and cultural identity over social, economic and environmental impact equals value. We commonly use the term culture in a very broad anthropological sense to describe the customs and beliefs of a society. But culture can also be used in a more limited way to refer to the arts in particular. The Warwick Commission is interested in the interaction between those two definitions. To what extent is Britain's culture defined by its arts culture? In what way have artists contributed to a vibrant, adaptable and comprehensive culture in this country? In what ways have artists failed to have that contribution recognised? In what way can we nail once and for all that art is not the extra, the luxury and the irrelevant when it comes to the really important things in life? The idea of a cultural ecosystem is emerging to enable us to determine the vital connections between policy, artistic practices, education and investment that are required for a high achieving and healthy cultural economy. We need to examine how we have failed as artists to join the dots and to contribute. How isolationist are we? How much are we still seen as aloof? I believe that culture is part of a vital value system. You can see very quickly how art and its associated activities, creative thought and freedom of expression are the first things that crumble as society breaks down. As value judgments and other people's values clash with your own, they increasingly become dangerous activities. They have to be repressed. And in many cases, the art itself must be destroyed. Artists imprisoned, books burnt, antiquities smashed, images destroyed. The reverse of this must therefore also be the case, that art, creative thought, and freedom of expression are a vital ingredient, the glue that holds our culture together and defines it for what it is. Its existence and its integration into everything we do is fundamental to a healthy society. As artists, if we are to be valued, we need to shed considerably more daylight on the role we play. And I would suggest that we are as much to blame as anyone for the fact that we are not seen. We are not on the boards of businesses, retail or banks. A month back, Ken Robinson quoted a recent IBM report. 
The top two aptitudes needed for businesses to succeed and for a person to succeed in business, number two, adaptability, number one, creativity. What are the aptitudes and capabilities that employers want from school leavers and university graduates? The evidence is there from what the CBI says, our educational process is not matching the demand. The creative industries are simply not seen as being a vital part of an important symbiotic ecosystem. This isn't actually about policy change. This is about behavioural change by artists, working with national and local authorities, with businesses and educationalists to recognise and increase how cultural contribution can enrich society and enhance our cultural identity. It is not, absolutely not, the role of politicians to lead in this thinking. It is us that must change the agenda and the policy will follow. The chief problem is how to place art within the other models of social activity, how to incorporate it into the texture of a particular pattern of life. It's a quote from Clifford Gertz, art as a cultural system. And that, for me, is what the RSA is all about. Enriching society through ideas and action and the connection and the interdependency between arts, manufacturing and commerce. Over the next few months, led by the chair of our family of academies, Sue Horner, the RSA will be working with education and cultural partners to test the feasibility of a new GCSE, or possibly a double GCSE in the arts, to develop young people's cultural knowledge and creativity across, let's say, two art forms. In promoting the arts as part of the good society, the RSA has the strength of its wide research and innovation remit. Whilst we've been working with artistic leaders to develop a new case for arts investment, the RSA's work with local government has opened up a new way of thinking. It's clear that unless we are members of our local community, and we think and act very differently. We face managing a major decline in both service standards and the quality of the public domain. The forms of local leadership now needed involve a number of elements. The development and articulation of an ambitious, distinctive and achievable joint vision. The bringing together of the key local actors from the public, private, civic and third sector and the inculcation of a deep and authentic commitment to a collaboration a rich engagement with the broader public, identifying and winning buy-in from local citizens, things they can actually contribute to themselves. Vision, collaboration and public engagement are all the kinds of nice warm words that tend to get attached to various local coordinating bodies, like, for example, a local strategic partnership set up by the last local government or the local enterprise partnerships of this government. The harsh reality is that these bodies tend to be little more than committees, which organisations and individuals either treat with disdain or through which they steadfastly pursue their own bureaucratic self-interest. Artists are rarely invited to join the party. How can rhetorical commitments to new forms of leadership, innovative practice and generous collaboration turn into something real in your community? This is where arts organisations and artists can come in. Their ethos, their method, their creativity can act as the catalyst for a new way of being and thinking. The question thus changes. Instead of how can we persuade the government and the public to protect the arts in tough times, it becomes how can arts and heritage organisations be prime movers in enabling places not only to survive, but prosper in these difficult times. For arts organisations and artists to make this offer and make it credibly, they'll need to examine their own ways of working. They will, in essence, need to see themselves as commissioned by the places in which they are based, a concept which, if taken seriously, is complex and very challenging. To act as place catalysts will involve developing a nuanced and grounded understanding of your own locality, its people, its needs, its culture, and its challenges. It will mean fending off those, and this will include some of their, their traditional allies, who see such an idea as instrumental or parochial. And it will involve the organizations showing how successful engagement in place leadership depends on being able to also create art and culture of intrinsic merit. It will mean bridging the gap between the amateur and the professional, the teacher and the learner, the have and the have not. Many arts organisations and artists would rightly claim to be already be catalysts for local change, just as many organisations claim to subsume their interests to the broader good of their locality. But not really many, and such claims are hollow, 
unless they are manifested in a genuine commitment to self-examination, financial prioritization, and heartfelt rhetorical reorientation. Over the last 30 years, our larger cultural organizations have moved from basic audience development to far more sophisticated forms of audience engagement and participation, especially through their education programs. Many smaller organizations led the way, built as many of them were on principles around socially engaged practice. If the ghost of the first National Theatre director, Laurence Olivier, visited that theatre today, his biggest surprise might, might not be the technological ambition of the productions or the fantastic nature of National Theatre Live. It would probably be the shock of an education department that employs 20 people and many more freelancers, is nationally broad and locally deep, with its own program to nurture young talent. A commitment of this scale would 30 years ago have been unthinkable, unrealistic, and if we're really honest, undesired. Like all shifts, the future is already out there. Place-based commissioning resonates with Joan Littlewood's theatre workshop process in the Theatre Royal Stratford East over 50 years ago and her vision for people's palaces all over the country. It was the principle of the founding of the West Yorkshire Playhouse, the National Theatre of Scotland and the National Theatre of Wales. Current practice to learn from includes the RSA work in Peterborough as well as Haring Woods and Forest Fringe. The larger institutions, arts policy and arts funding, will need to boldly go where some people already are. So return, to return to the beginning and the equation, and remember a time when art was taken for granted as part of our culture in common. When art was inseparable, from our craft and making things, to our everyday use of story, song and dance, to teach and learn. Perhaps it is our fault as artists, that we have appeared to grow apart from our culture in common. Art, for its own sake, sought to place art beyond value, beyond the messiness of the market and everyday life. But in our age, of course, no activity is beyond the reach of value. And we must ask again, what is the real and irreducible value of art in our lives and our culture? And make sure we play our part in the well-being of society as a whole. The point you made in your speech is, what it, is about this relationship between capital C culture and sociological culture. And I kind of sense that what, what we're saying about places, and can tell me if this is right, is that there is a kind of view which is that culture is kind of lipstick on the pig, that you live in a place that's a bit grim, but at least we've got a theatre for, for the nice people to go to. And the question that isn't asked is, well, actually, how could we make the... I don't know if you can, well, there's metaphors breaking down, but you know what I mean? How, <laughs> how can we not just be lipstick, but how can we make the pig beautiful? Uh, yeah, and, and, and I think the, the lottery has been one of the biggest keys to unlock that door, because for the first time there really is a debate going on about what sort of world do you want, um, what sort of theatre do you want, sort of, what sort of art space do you want, and then quite quickly there's a progression into, well, hang on a minute, that, it doesn't stop at the door, does it actually? It goes out into the street and then it goes down the road and it's round the corner and it's everywhere. And the Theatre's Trust actually struggled really hard to get um, culture, arts, into the planning framework uh, in the revision that's been happening recently. And I don't think we stood up you know, nearly enough and helped them in that fight. And it, it is about our entire community. It is about our entire society. But of course, sociologists, I would say to you, wouldn't I? Yeah, but duh, that's what Shakespeare's all about. Mm. You know, <laughs> us as people and how we interact with each other. Um, and so if you're going to be in a world where that is, that is your job to hold that, that mirror up, it would seem to be natural that you should be involved in many others because how should you, could you have the audacity to say that about one element of life and not many others? And Good. I am frustrated by the fact that, that, and I guess I've sat back going, well, I am not invited to the table. But I think that in the process of writing this speech, it became really clear to me that that was actually my problem.